2011, American Management Association survey said their number one fear was speaking. Less than half that number, 19%, said their number one fear was death. <laughs> perspective for you. <laughs> but I did my own survey. Five percent of the people in my survey said their number one fear was the bathroom scale. <laughs> I can't do anything tonight about the bathroom scale or wrinkle, but I deal with both. What I can do is ease the trepidation about the number one fear public speaking. How often do you hear voices in your head saying, numbers are boring to most people, they don't want to hear about that, or I know spreadsheets, but I can't talk to groups, or I'm shy, they won't want to listen to me. Give me a calculator, not a microphone. <laughs> Tonight you will leave knowing you not only can speak to groups, but you might even enjoy the process. I saw that look. <laughs> I could hear the brain saying, oh no. You don't know how I feel. It may be easy for you. I may not know exactly how you feel, but I can come pretty close. When they first started asking me to speak, I had the shaky knees. I had the lump. I had the lump in my throat the size of Texas. I know what it feels like to stretch out of my comfort zone. And that's what you're probably feeling about public speaking right now. I see some nods, yes. When was the last time you stretched so far out of your comfort zone, you couldn't even see the edges of it anymore? And when you tried it, you found out it wasn't really as bad as you thought it would be. And the second time was a little bit easier. The time after that was a little bit easier yet. Tonight you're going to have an absolute system you can use that will give you a structure for your speech so you will not forget what you're talking about. You will know how to connect with your audience, not just communicate, connect with your audience. And you will know how to connect your message with your audience. You already know your jobs. You know the walk. Are you ready to learn how to talk the walk? If you are, come on. Say I'm ready. Oh, boy, did I hear a presentation <laughs> Okay. Uh, I think the bar was still open. You may want one more. <laughs> what I would like to do, first and foremost, Cindy, will you be my scribe for me? I will, I will. What I'm going to ask you to do is turn to your next door neighbor and tell them your greatest fear about public presentation. <coughs> and then I'm going to ask you to call out some of those, because I'm going to be certain I cover tonight everything that is most pressing to you, giving you the tips and techniques you need in order to ease those butterflies. <coughs> it really can be an enjoyable experience. I'll give you a little hint later on as to how I came to be doing this. So, you have a minute. Talk to your next door neighbor. 
and share your greatest fear about public speaking. <laughs> to public speaking. So who would like to call out a few things? Cindy is going to write them down, and then I want to make certain that I address each and every one of those. Heather? I have two. Okay. Slowing down. Slowing down. Not talking too fast. Correct. You're trying not to run, run off. Da, da, da. Yes. Okay. To be eloquent. <laughs> to be eloquent. Okay. Okay. Oh, my goodness. So to be interesting, kind of, is what you want. And enunciate properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The enunciation and avoiding the ums, 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 and duh. <laughs> <laughs> we do try to avoid those. <laughs> yes, Anyone else? Come on. Yes. I think okay. even like making eye contact with the uh, with the people in the audience is challenging. Making eye contact. It's much easier to look down and you know not look out and address the people. Well, you know, the shy guy mm -hmm. looks at his own shoes, and if he's really brave, he sold it to yours instead. Of his. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who else? because I had a boss who got up and stole every line and I was supposed to open the seminar. He stole every point of mine and, I, and then he introduced me. <laughs> One of the best ways to learn how to avoid that is joining Toastmasters and doing table topics because that's a minute to two minutes and you have no knowledge in advance what they're going to ask you and that is one of the best trainings you can ever receive for that, you want me to talk about what? <laughs> that will help you a great deal, but I can give you some hints on that as well. Okay, who else? Yes? Um, effectively dealing with an unknown situation. You, you know, you agree to do a last minute type thing and you just, you know, it, it's a brand new thing and you really don't know what to expect. So just being able and to deal with that with poise and, you know, kind of flowing with it. An unknown situation, I mean, as in not knowing your audience, not knowing your subject. New audience, new subject, materials you got the day before that weren't complete. You know, the whole the whole nine yards. And so you're 1130 the night before, you're like, ah, what have I agreed to do? And you have to go in there the next day and, you know, provide an effective presentation. So, you know, just staying balanced with that. Okay. I know how to do that. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Yes. Um, not being able able to answer a question that's posed to you, like if you don't have the answer to a question. If you don't have the answer to the question, <laughs> tell them you don't know the question, but you will go find out. Do find out and get back to them later. Be honest. If you don't know it, tell them, I probably should know it, but I don't know that answer. Get their contact information and get the answer to them later. That's the easiest way to handle that one. That way, they know what you're telling them is the truth. Try to bluff it and fake it, and you'll destroy your credibility. Don't do that. Okay? There was one I was expecting to come up that hasn't yet. Peggy? Being engaging enough, not being boring. Oh, that was easy. 
That one's easy. You, there will be an answer coming to that one. Yes. There was one I was expecting that I haven't heard. Yes. Um, just being, I mean, you practice a lot ahead of time, but then you're so nervous that you can't remember anything you've practiced. That's what I was expecting. <laughs> That's what I was expecting. Okay. Cindy, I'm going to have you come back up and give me those in a little while. I'll remember as many as I can for right now. Forgetting your lines. I was recently judge at five of six Toastmasters Division International Speech Contests. And in three of those five divisions, one, of the six contestants totally forgot their speech. The reason is they were in their head trying to memorize word for word. Don't ever try to memorize your speech. If you're in your head thinking about your next words, you're not looking at the audience. If you internalize rather than memorize, you know your main points, and you will easily flow from main point to main point. If you forget one sentence you thought you wanted to say, you wrote your speech. Nobody's going to know it except you. Don't worry about it. internalize, not memorize. Because that way you can look at your audience and hold that eye contact for a full thought. That way you're making a connection with your audience rather than talking over the top of their heads. Make a connection. And that makes that much easier. Okay, what was something else on the list? Um, I'm sorry, I caught you in mid-cookie. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not being able to engage eye contact. Not being able to engage the eye contact. Did you notice tonight I went around to shake hands and introduce myself? I think I met everyone with maybe one exception, but I think I made it around to everyone. Yep, did you get that? No, because you came in late. <laughs> <laughs> Greeting your audience in advance and saying hello to them puts them at ease and puts you at ease. You can look at your best friend. So what I want you to do is picture your best friends in the audience. I know there was a point in time when they said, picture the audience in their underwear. I grew up on a Kansas farm. There are people I don't want to see that way. I want to put my clothes. Picture your best friends. It works a lot easier. Next question on the list. Having to be spontaneous. Having to be spontaneous. What I want you to do is keep a story file. I advise you to keep it on your desktop. And you're looking at me like, I, I don't have any stories. Give me five minutes with you, and I can pull out lots of stories that you can use. When you have to be spontaneous, you can pull out one of those stories. The audience immediately warms up, and you can flow into whatever it is that you need to say. Even if you want to say, I'd like to reiterate what Mr. Head Macho just said. And you can get away with it just as smooth as silk. In public speaking training, that's called a callback. It's referring back to something that was said earlier. And if he stole all your lines, You've got a cute little story to come out with, and then you do a call back to his presentation, and you look like a star. 
don't ever let him put you down, girl. Um. <laughs> Next. Not being able to answer a question. Okay, covered that one. Not being boring. Not being boring. Part of the secret on not being boring is to have stories. People may not remember your point, but they will remember your story. And because they remember your story, they will remember your point. Little short stories can save you over and over. I keep catching you at precisely the wrong time. I'm sorry. To be eloquent with enunciation. <clears throat> the eloquence comes with practice and being totally at ease. And what's going to put you more at ease than anything else is knowing your audience, knowing your subject, and really knowing that you are of value. You're a very important person or you would never have been asked to speak. So give yourself a little credit. Someone believed in you so much that they gave you the spotlight. I ask you to believe in you. One of the things that I'm going to offer, and I was going to do it later, but I'll do it right now. I'm going to offer 15 minutes of free coaching to everyone in this room. I will give you 15 minutes of just sitting down one-on-one. -on -one. You tell me what it is that will help you the very most. And we will spend that entire time putting you at ease. <laughs> Slowing down is talking too fast. Breathe. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Kim could have played center for the Denver Broncos. He was a big boy. And he had gotten a new IT job. And he was a mess. He was so nervous. And I said, Mike. Four minutes. Take a deep breath. Will it help? <laughs> <laughs> he gave these four minutes. I let the breath out. <laughs> <laughs> what you can learn to do is pause. If you start getting nervous, pause. Bring something in for audience interaction so that you have a chance to catch your breath. And that's the greatest way to calm you down. And yes, breathing is good. Breathing during the presentation is also good. But give it a pause. I think President Obama does that well. He pauses, it seems like, a lot when he's speaking. To he loses his place on the teleprompter. <laughs> <laughs> but no, pausing will help you relax and asking a question of the audience, a you-focused question, because that brings them into it. You notice the questions I would have asked, do you feel, have you felt, because each individual then answers it inside of them. That lets you breathe and it brings your audience to you. Well, the thing I like about the pausing is, is when I'm listening to a speaker, then I can just think for a second about what they just said. It gives me a second to absorb, you know, absorb that last line. And so then when they start speaking again, you know, it, it like helps me interact with the speaker. That's exactly what it does. If you're talking 90 miles an hour and you're just zipping it right along, That's me. No. you're going to wear your audience out. <laughs> you literally do. You wear your audience out. 
So if you will pause, it will help you and it will help them. If people saw the uh, King's Speech, the movie The King's Speech, mm -hmm. yeah. you can see where the pauses were placed in that written document. And that was part of the key of his conquering his stuttering as well. Because if you learn to breathe, then you are, if you can imagine, it's a comma. Think of it as a comma. The point of a comma is that it's a moment to stop. It's not as hard as a period, but it's a comma to take a breath and then move on with the rest of your It speech. absolutely works. The rest of the story on Mike Hill. Four months later, he was giving presentations for his company and had received a promotion. Now he still paces like a man, but he's doing better and he's already received a promotion and he's up for another one. Public speaking can be acquired and it can end up giving you tremendous benefits in your work. Our last one is effectively dealing with the unknown situations, new audience, new material. What I want you to do with a situation like that is to know your main points. If it is not your material and you don't know your audience, you're going to have to hit the main points and don't worry about if they have content in there that you miss. Also, put in your own stories. Don't be afraid to make it yours. Someone asked me for a suggestion on hands. I've seen people who hide behind the podium. You know, the lecture. They're, they're hiding, holding on for dear life. But others will be out in front of the audience. I'm going to hand you this for a minute. One of the frequent is the eave, the fig leaf, or the reverse fig leaf. <laughs> Just relax. <laughs> it really works. You can let your hands be very natural. If you have a gesture, make sure it makes sense. There are people who put in all sorts of wild gestures with no purpose. That's distracting. But welcoming someone with an open hand rather than a point. A point is accusatory. An open hand is welcoming. That works very well as a body movement, and I prefer to call it a body movement rather than a gesture, because gestures make it sound like it's something forced that you had to put in. I'm Irish and Italian, I talk with my hands. <laughs> An effective presentation is like a beautiful woman. It catches the eye, captivates the attention, awakens all the senses, makes you say, tell me more. I want to know more. And just like that beautiful woman, an effective presentation has an excellent structure. <laughs> Patricia Fripp, leading speaking coach for National Speakers Association, certified speaking professional, first female president of National Speakers Association, her accolades go forever, has designed a very simple speech structure. And if the handouts have not gone around, they can go out now. The very first one at the top of this 
and I have three different speech structures, and you want to look at the page that has the colors. The first one is Patricia Fripp's speech structure. That's the best way to handle those impromptus, is set it out in a structure you know and can follow. The first thing is the opening. The job of the opening is to catch the attention. Just like the beautiful woman catches the attention, the first thing you want with your opening is to catch the attention. Notice I did not start with, so nice to be here, I'm happy that you invited me, rah, rah, rah. Those are all throwaways. Open with a bang. Open with a story, a dialogue, a quotation, a statistic, a shocking headline, a tasteful joke. There are any number of openings you can use. Then you go into the body. You make a point, tell a story to back it up. They may not remember your point, but they'll remember your story. Because they remember your story, voila, they remember your point. And the first time you've been asked to speak for 25 minutes, you're going into, I can't talk that long, there's no way I can't do that. But if you break it down into two minutes for an opening, 10 minutes for each of two main points, three minutes for a conclusion, looking at it as two, 10, 10, three, 25 minutes and you're off the stage. That's not a problem, is it? Break it down into its parts. Just like all of your financial reports are organized, they're in categories. They have a logical format. So this is speech. And it really works. So let's break it into our parts. The opening. I opened with a statistic. I do statistics frequently when I am speaking to more of an analytical, numerical, technical group. That's something you relate to as numbers. If I was speaking to network marketers, I would have to do something like a shocking headline, something to jar them away because they think they've heard it all. Some of them even think they know it all. <laughs> you can open with a dialogue. I have one of my speeches that I open with, you can't do that, Elaine, that's a dumb idea. You'll go broke. Then it makes you want to know what's the rest of that story. <laughs> You'll find out a little later on today. There's another that you can open with a quotation. There are quotation books in every library, every bookstore, Brian Tracy, Napoleon Hill, Jim Rohn, Science of Getting Rich, Wallace Waddles, uh, Success Magazine. There are any number of them that will dump a quotation in your inbox every day. And if you're really organized, you'll put them in categories. Quotations work very well. Joel Osteen is pastor of Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas, which is the alpha of mega churches. He always opens with a self-deprecating joke. I have one of my speeches that I open with a few bars from my theme song. Don't tell me I can't, don't tell me I won't, and don't tell me I'm past my prime. <laughs> Something to get the attention to start. The job of the opening is to make them say, ooh, this could be fun. I'd like to hear the rest of this. That's the entire purpose of your opening. And then make a point, tell a story to back it up. 
and you want each one of those main points to be about 10 minutes. The reason is, if you put too much information into that one little time span, your audience is either going to be confused or overwhelmed. And the confused mind does nothing. If you're speaking, you want them to have a walk away message and you want them to take some action. So you don't want to put so much information in that they're overwhelmed and they just tune out. But you don't want to ramble either. I had a college economics professor. I think his forte was boredom. <laughs> <laughs> he talked in a monotone. We had to count his little mannerisms fiddle in his glasses, fiddle in his tie, just in order to stay awake. Ever attended one of those presentations where they talked in a monotone? You couldn't wait to get out of there, could you? We don't have windows here, so at least you're not going to jump, but you know, it is a third floor. You want to break up your presentation. Break it up with a dialogue. Break it up with something other than strict narration. Does that make sense to you? The song is a good idea. Oh, it's a blast. Because it's unexpected. Yeah. It's very unexpected, actually. <laughs> 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 the only thing I thought that was interesting was when you said something like, well, here's the recipe for, you know, getting rich. Well, of course, everybody's, you know, you start to focus right away. That would be a really good open line. If you can give them that recipe, you've got it. <laughs> that, and that's something that's really important to bring up. Whatever you tell them, you want to be able to deliver what you tell them. You tell it the way you sell it. If you sell it saying, I'm going to give you the secret for being rich, then deliver it. I want to come to that one. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to Donna. Oh. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> there, and I'm, I'm going to digress for just a minute. There is a good segment in every economy. There really is. And it's knowing where to be, when to be there, and what to do with it. It's having timely, accurate information and the knowledge of what to do with it. Talk to a professional that that's their area of expertise. I don't pretend to be all things to all people. You asked me a question earlier, and I said, if you don't know the answer, go find out. I am not a certified financial planner. I am not the one to give financial planning advice. That's Donna's area of expertise. I can tell you how to be comfortable with an audience and have fun with them. I can do that. So I'll do what I do best, and when someone asks me, one of my coaching clients, because I have a number of coaching clients, either entrepreneurs, speaking, coaching clients, if they ask me a question I don't know the answer, I go find the expert who does know that answer. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know it, but I'll find out. And then follow through. Do find out for them. That's really important. Is this helping you? Is this giving you some ideas to make it a little bit easier for you? You were talking about being a little nervous about coming up in front of people. There was one other note that someone gave me on hand, oh, it was hands and speaking too fast. Those were the two that I wanted to make sure that I covered. Connecting with your audience. Part of connecting with your audience 
is going around and meeting people. That puts them at ease and puts you at ease. Picturing your best friends as your audience is great. That helps. Your presentation starts the minute you walk in the door. Because they're looking at you. They're wanting to know, are you relaxed? Are you comfortable? Are you happy being here? And wear your favorite outfit. Serious. If you're worried about being nervous, wear your favorite outfit. Now that's assuming it's not a wild Hawaiian floral or one of those geometric designs that makes your eyes cross. And I recommend no dangly, bangly, jangly earrings. You don't want anything to distract from your message. White slacks are never advisable for a lady on stage. <laughs> because it draws the eye down and away from your face and your message. Anybody in here old enough to remember Debbie Reynolds? Mm -hmm. Oh, good! <laughs> As Debbie matured, she wore darker and darker lipstick to call attention to her mouth. Do things that draw the eye up to your face and to your message. Short, tight skirts, probably not a good idea. <laughs> if you have a male audience, they have enough trouble concentrating. <laughs> <laughs> I promise somebody I'd give you one of the Goodyear stories. I was seated at my desk, very nice and demure, and one of the guys came in and he was livid. If that air could be blue, it was blue. He was swear like a trooper. I want to see the boss. Yes, sir. May I help you? I don't want to talk to any. And he had sort of words in there. Secretary, I want to talk to the boss. Yes, sir. When he finally realized he was speaking, to the boss. He had to sit down and talk like a human being. But he kept staring. And I finally said, excuse me, sir, my face is up here. <laughs> After that, he settled down and we talked. And we solved the problem. Men have trouble concentrating. <laughs> We talked about your first audience being your two best friends. My first audience was 40. Senior high school boys. <laughs> On my 21st birthday, there was a buzz in the room. We've got a girl taking off. There's a girl in law class. Oh. <coughs> It's the teacher? And then I had to put the last name Love on the board. <laughs> Did I mention this was at Shawnee Mission East High School in Kansas City? Do you know Shawnee Mission East? In 1965, that was the third richest school district in United States. Oh, I'm looking at the analyticals in the room, <laughs> saying, 21st birthday, 1965. That makes her... <laughs> 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 My colleague... <laughs> I was Thank trying you. to figure out all these rich people Elaine, there's very little age proximity here. 
It's very close. Don't dress like the students. This was the third richest school district in the United States. No problem, I couldn't afford to. <laughs> so your first audience is going to be easier. I can guarantee it. But I'm going to have to get back. Or <laughs> you're going to be getting my double-breasted buttons instead. <laughs> I have a video camera going because one of the ways to help you with your presentations is to video yourself as you speak. And I want you to watch that video in three different ways. And this is something you want for your notes. First, I want you to watch it as is, sound and visual. Then I want you to watch it, do it again, and turn the sound off. And you're looking for weird little mannerisms, <laughs> anything you may do. When I first started teaching, I realized I kind of cocked my head to the side and I had to work on getting over that. It was a mannerism that could be distracting. <coughs> the third way I want you to watch it is actually listening to it. Play it again and turn your back to it. Because your audience will be audio, visual, and kinesthetic learners. If you do it in all three ways, it will help you know how every segment of your audience hears your message. Had you ever heard of doing it that way before? It makes sense though. It tells you how your audience really hears you. So that gives you some ideas on structuring your speech. So let's go on through. We have point one, which is the learning an actual structure. We have point two, which is learning to connect yourself with your audience. And because I have a little more time, I'm going to do a point three. I want you to connect your message with your audience as well. Tell it the way you sell it. It's okay you to have all three. After you make your second point, if you're going to do questions and answers, do it then. How many speakers have you heard end with Q&A? Most of us. Do you know why you don't want to do that? All it takes is a rogue, off-the-wall, question. Something that may be totally off topic. And as the audience leaves, they're thinking about that weird question instead of thinking about your main message. So when you take Q&A, do it after your last main point and before your conclusion. And take either a specified number of questions or a specified time limit to questions. Yes? I have a question about that. Sure. I've been to speeches both ways, where they do it at the end or they do it in between. And I'm confused about that because to me, if they're doing it in while they're speaking, it can get you off topic. How okay. do you handle that? If someone asks you a question, so let's say you do it after your main point, right. something totally not to that point, how do you get them focused back on? Okay, you're getting a question that is totally off topic. Okay, I have gotten that. In, in fact, there are some hilarious things on the CDs over there about that. And I simply say, I'm sorry, that's not the subject of this particular presentation. Please see me afterwards and I'll be happy to address it then. And that way, you stay on your topic. And some of them will do that just to see what you'll do. 
I've, I've spoken to a great many that I know. They're just throwing that out to see what I'll do. Don't worry, baby, we can handle it. <laughs> but that's exactly what you do, Heather. Just tell them, you know, that's not really the subject right now. See me afterwards, and I'll be happy to address that. And that kind of voice. Yeah. <laughs> very nice, very sweet, you know. You're not demeaning, you're not putting them down, anything. You're just staying on your topic. You're staying focused. And there's no problem with that. Okay? Does that answer? Yes. Then your summary. Ouch, that time went fast. Your summary is one powerful story that encompasses all of your main points. So the one I'm going to give you tonight, do you ride a bicycle? Have you ridden a bicycle? <laughs> Helped anyone ride a bicycle? <laughs> <laughs> the best way for people to remember your point is to tell a story. And the best way for all members of your audience to hear and retain that story is to add in all five senses. Most people learn to ride a bicycle at three, four, five. I grew up on a Kansas farm. We had what they called gravel roads. Really, they were orange and grapefruit-sized rocks. That is not the surface to learn to ride a bicycle. So we had horses. So I learned to ride a bicycle as an adult. I was already a married lady with a baby boy. Come with me to Sioux City, Iowa. It's a beautiful, sunshiny day, blue sky. It's the aroma of lilacs in the air. The Hankoski boys, my next door neighbors, had decided to teach me how to ride a bicycle. The Hankowski boys ranged in age from five to ten. <laughs> Do you know how fearless five to ten-year-old boys can be? They said, no problem, Mrs. Love. You just hold on to the handlebars, point the bicycle downhill, and the speed will keep you up. <laughs> Remember that stretching out of your comfort zone? Baby, I can't even see the edges of that comfort zone anymore. <laughs> but I'm determined to learn. Remember, don't tell me I can't. I have a death grip on those handlebars. And they gave me a boost. And I start going faster and faster and faster and faster. And I am screaming, but I'm so scared. That sound coming out. <laughs> Ever see one of those cartoons that's all eyes because they're so scared? And then boom, I hit the curb over the handlebars, face first in the dirt and the weeds in the ditch. I can hear the Hinkoski boys laughing hysterically <laughs> at the top of the hill. And then all of a sudden you hear them, oh my God, this is Mrs. Love. What if she's hurt? <laughs> Are you okay? And they come running down the hill. Let me help you up. Are, are you hurt? Are you mad at us? <laughs> no, Eric, I'm not mad at you. But do you mind next time if we start on the flat at the top of the cul-de-sac instead of the steep hill? <laughs> you mean you'll do it again? <laughs> When you stretch out of your comfort zone, you grow, you learn, and you make progress. You grow as a person, you grow in all of your competencies. You didn't get to this position without stretching out of your comfort zone. I'm encouraging you to make one more stretch and really embrace the idea you can go from panic to power in your presentations. It can 
and give you promotions, profit, and peace of mind that you have really accomplished something. I encourage you, stretch out of your comfort zone. You will be absolutely delighted at the results. There is so much with public speaking, I could write a book on it. In fact, I am. <laughs> so I could just give you a few things tonight. Come talk to me. I'm serious about the 15 minutes of free coaching. Let me help you be all you can be. Thank you very much. I'd like to expand a little bit.